If only I could go back and change some things. Set things straight. I wish I had a do-over. I've made choices. I've lost out. I've wished a thousand times I could go back and try again. It's hard not to imagine what might have been. If I had just stopped to think. If I had just done as I was told. If I hadn't thought I knew it all. Why didn't I just take a few deep breaths? It took one second to listen. Maybe my life would be better. Maybe there wouldn't be such a high price to pay. Things would be different now. I wouldn't have so many regrets. But is everything lost? Can I just get a do-over? Is there a way back to new beginnings? Because regret can mean a new beginning. When it's given to the one who produces a repentance. A repentance that delivers me from my grief. The one who takes my mistakes. And somehow redeems me through them. Who tells me I'm not the sum total of all my regrets? He tells me not to look back. Because there's nothing there to see. I am not my mistakes. He is faithful and just to forgive me. I just have to ask him. And then I can look straight forward. Forget what is behind me. And strain towards what is ahead. And walk away with all regrets erased by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Every day I'm given a clean slate. A clean slate. I get a clean slate. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, if you've ever heard uh, one of my sermons and thought an 11 year old could have done that well, well you're not all wrong. I have many people that help me with my uh, sermons, including my 11 year old grandson. He's uh, always uh, telling me about a story or sometimes he'll text me and say, uh, Grandpa, here's a good joke you can use in your sermon. So, <laughs> bad joke warning. There was a man who woke up one morning and his, his little dog, as always, was laying beside him. But when he got up, the dog didn't move. He poked the dog and the dog didn't react. And he thought, oh no, my dog could be dead. And so he rushed the dog to the uh, veterinarian hospital and he asked the vet on duty, what's wrong with my dog? And the doctor took out his stethoscope and listened a little bit and the vet said, I, your dog is dead. And the man said, well, isn't there something you can do? I mean, some highfalutin thing, medical technology uh, that you can use to bring him back and the man uh, left the examination room and bought, uh, brought in a Labrador retriever. Uh, the dog uh, sniffed a little bit, then uh, he took that dog out, and next he brought in a cat. He put the cat on the examination table, and the cat kind of sniffed around and clawed uh, the dog's body a little bit. And then he took the, the cat out, and the vet came back and said, uh, Sir? Your dog is dead. That'll be $600. And the man said, $600? That's outrageous. And the vet says, well, I was going to charge you just $50. Then you insisted on the lab and cat scan. <laughs> and yes, there is a point. <laughs> That's the hard part about, you know, I have to wait to tell these stories until I have a point. And yes, there is a point. People were not just a little sick when Jesus died for them. They were dead. And a dead person can't do anything to fix themselves. In Christ alone, we find the answer for eternal life. The gospel is not good advice for sick people. 
It is good news for those who are spiritually dead. I believe in the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're studying Colossians, and Paul wants the Christians there to mature. He wants them to grow, and he says they need to do that by putting down deep roots in the Lord. And this morning, I want us to consider part of what that entails, the triumph of Christ. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Paul writes, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Now, there's a lot there to unpack. But I want to call your attention to what I believe is the key verse in all of that, and that is verse 15. It's talking about what Jesus triumphantly put aside by dying on the cross. And that is really the focus of this section. You see, there will always be a wide range of opinions and perspectives about every little thing that people are going to have, but Christ followers should always try to keep the main thing as the most important thing. And for thus, uh, for us, that should be Jesus triumphant over sin on the cross. That's good news. Sometimes we don't appreciate how good it is. Few people would ever even put those two words together, triumphant and cross. Because the general point of view in the first century was that crosses were for the lowest of the low. Uh, there was nothing about a person that was good who died on a cross. They committed the most horrific sins. And they deserved that kind of painful, terrible death. And yet, 
That's the kind of death that Jesus chose to die for you and I. 600 years before Jesus walked this earth, uh, they were holding the ancient Olympic Games in Greece. There was a man named uh, Arikion, and Arikion was recognized as the greatest uh, wrestler of his time. He was an Olympic champion uh, for three uh, Olympiads in a row. And he was in his fourth Olympiad, and he was uh, in the finals. He was the favorite, um, but he was wrestling a much younger, quicker, stronger man. Now, they had almost no rules. Uh, anything went. In, uh, it was almost like hand-to-hand -hand combat. And this young man had grabbed a Ricky on, and uh, he had him, uh, uh, his arm around his neck, and he was about to suffocate him. Ricky on, though he wouldn't surrender, he somehow reached around, grabbed the young man's ankle, and broke it. And the man fell to the ground, and he tapped out, uh, saying, Ricky on, uh, what? But as soon as uh, he tapped out, Arikion fell dead on top of him, of his injuries. And so uh, people who write uh, Olympic history say Arikion is the only man who won by dying. Well, he's not the only one. He's not the most important one. Our Lord won by dying. And we need to understand the beauty and the power of that. Mature believers are secure believers because they are deeply rooted in the triumph of Christ. Let me give you two just kind of big notions this morning that I think we have to be absolutely convinced about. Number one, the triumph of the cross puts our need to earn our salvation to death. Look again at verse 13. It says quite simply, before Christ, you were dead in your sins. And remember this simple, this simple principle. Dead people can't do anything to make themselves undead. The essence of the gospel. is that outside of Christ, we were spiritually dead because of our sins, without any way to save ourselves. And so God took on human form. He lived among us. He lived without sin among us, so that he could willingly die for us to pay the debt that we could not pay ourselves. Now, when you hear about that, and you hear the ultimate uh, point about the gospel, that we can't save ourselves except to put our trust in what Christ did for us in a way that the Bible describes, the reaction to that very simply could be, well, is that all there is? I, I just have to... Uh, put my trust, declare my faith in the way the Bible says, and I can know the salvation of Jesus in my life. And that's right. But it doesn't sound like that's enough. It should be more complicated than that. There, there should be more. And that is why immature Christians can so easily fall into legalism. Legalism starts with thinking that we need Jesus plus something else to make ourselves more worthy of God's salvation. And so in Colossae, it was a kind of melting pot of different philosophies, different points of views. There were a lot of different religions and new Christians would probably feel like they were easy pickings. Uh, 
If they didn't have much of a root system in Jesus, well, they were probably very swayable, uh, maybe even gullible. But Paul is having nothing of that. He wants those young Christians to know that being a Christian is not about Jesus plus Jewish circumcision. It's not about Jesus plus keeping certain rules about what you eat or drink, or Jesus plus keeping various religious festivals. Jesus plus worshiping uh, a new moon. Jesus plus uh, abusing your body in some way. Uh, Jesus plus the worshiping of angels. We don't need Jesus plus anything to merit our salvation that Jesus provides. Salvation is in Christ alone. And you really need to be sure about that. In Christ alone. And the moment we add some human effort to the work of Jesus, we diminish what our Savior did for us. Uh, Paul goes on to talk about this in Colossians 2, verse 20. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, uh, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teaching. Uh, God gave the people of Israel ten commands. Short, to the point, fairly easy to understand. But the Hebrews couldn't deal with that. And, and, and so eventually became this group of writings that's known as the Mishnah, which is um, taking those Ten Commands and expanding upon them to describe uh, what a person really need to do to keep them. There were 14 volumes in the Mishnah. Uh, there were 39 categories, 69 tracts, and 683 different rules. Ten Commands became 683 rules. I was talking about my class, uh, Thursday morning class, about this uh, 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 last week. Uh, you know, it was uh, a violation of the Sabbath to look in a mirror on the Sabbath. Uh, it wasn't wrong for your chicken to lay an egg, and I imagine that was to the great relief of chickens. And you could sell that egg to a Gentile, but you couldn't eat it yourself. And these were the kind of rules. They go on and on and on. And all they did was make it even harder to please God. Now, no one ever plans to be a legalist. It's kind of like me eating at Taco Bell. I never set out to eat at Taco Bell, but occasionally I find myself there. And that's kind of what legalism is like. Uh, now don't misunderstand, please. Uh, there are things in Christ that he wants us to do. Uh, there is a way that he wants us to think. There is a way that he wants us to live. Uh, there are commands in Jesus. There are principles to uh, live by. There are doctrines to trust in. But all of this is done in order to honor uh, Jesus. Uh, such things are always fueled not by fear, but they're fueled by gratitude for the salvation that Jesus totally gives us by his death on the cross. Outside of Christ, we're dead in our sins, and there's no amount of polishing on the outside that will make the dead parts on the inside to live again. We need God's help. We need God's power. And so there's kind of two warnings that go along with this first big idea. And that is, first of all, if you become legalistic, uh, 
you could use it to feel all superior to somebody else. Verse 18 warns about how it can puff up a person. It gives them a false sense of arrogance. Some use merit salvation to not just feel superior to somebody that they perceive does less than they to be holy, but they use it as a tool of judgment. Why is it that among Christians you will find some of the most judgmental people you'll ever run into? Many times it is tied to this Jesus plus orientation to how we make ourselves more acceptable uh, to God. And the second thing I would caution you about is that merit salvation calls you to eventually question your own salvation. That's the completion of the circle. A person who's been so hard on others, uh, thinking, you know, I do this and this, and God's really pleased with that, and you don't do that, instead you do this and this. Well, eventually they find themselves on their deathbed, and they realize that they haven't kept all the rules either. They haven't been perfect, and they wonder if they've been good enough to go to heaven. And that's where that leads. And the second big idea is this. The triumph of the cross puts being haunted by guilt to death. People are speaking directly of the Ten Commands in uh, verses 13 through 15. And I have heard a number of people, uh, this is the Baptist, uh, baptistry draining or doing something back there. So don't let that noise, a noise bother you. Focus in on what I'm trying to say here. Listen hard. Sort of sounds like I've got indigestion. And I guarantee you that's, uh, that's not happening yet. I have heard uh, a lot of people uh, refer to this verse about what got nailed to the cross. And you see, uh, they'll say, uh, Jesus nailed the Ten Commandments to the cross. That's not exactly what it says. Um, God doesn't give imperfect commands. Now, when it comes to uh, all the festivals and uh, uh, the uh, religious um, uh, strategies and, you know, the sacrifice of uh, animals and so on, well, all of that, the writer says, Paul says, that is always best understood in Christ. And a lot of that was simply leading up uh, to prepare people to when the Son of God came uh, to earth. You realize that every one of the Ten Commands is given again in the New Testament? When you say, now wait a minute, this keep the Sabbath day. If you understand Hebrews chapter 4, every one of the Ten Commandments are given again in the New Testament. It's not that the commandments were bad. They were godly. But the people who tried to keep them weren't. No one proved themselves good enough to keep those commands. Uh, the Hebrews had a basic choice. Uh, they could make the commands smaller and minimize them and thus make it easier to say, like the rich young ruler did, I've kept the command from my youth up. Well, he hadn't. He just uh, minimized them and made them uh, easier to say you did keep. But the idea of the commands wasn't the issue. It was the guilt. It was this sense of inadequacy that came from trying to keep what you could not keep perfectly. Uh, notice in the text, when it's talking about this, Paul says that these commandments were against us. 
and that they stood opposed to us. And that's the problem. It's not that the commandments were flawed, it's that people are flawed who are trying to keep them perfectly. If you can't perfectly obey, then how are we ever going to earn our salvation? And that's the question. And that's the invitation of guilt into our lives. Now, a little guilt here and there, that's a healthy thing. When you mess up, you uh, need to have kind of a negative reflection on that. And you say, man, I messed up. i got to do better about this or that. But people often will welcome guilt as their constant companion in life. And that is not the intention of Jesus and why he died on the cross. It's like Paul says to the uh, Christians at Galatia in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Verse 24, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. Part of the reason that God gave the Hebrews the law was so they could realize they couldn't keep it and they desperately needed a Savior. It was to lead them to Jesus. That was the purpose. When a person died on a cross, they were stripped. What that means is they didn't wear a stitch of clothing. They were spiked, and people would walk by and they'd make fun of their body. Uh, imagine how would it be if you were spiked on a cross, you could not move except to push yourself by the spike uh, in your ankles, to push yourself up to breathe, which was agonizing. But, you know, what would people make fun of about your body as they walked by? I mean, there's not many of us that really like our body in its current condition, right? Can you imagine the jokes? And that was part of the, uh, the curse of the cross. It, it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. But what is said here in Colossians 2 is Jesus is saying through the Apostle Paul, that's what I did to guilt. I stripped it. I made it into a public spectacle. Uh, that's what he says in verse 15. Paul says the guilt over trying to be saved by merit has been canceled. The NIV uses the term uh, disarmed. But Paul uses a very powerful word in the original language that sometimes our English language just doesn't uh, uh, do justice to, uh, the original Greek word meant he destroyed it. Absolutely wiped it out. And folks, if the blood of Jesus wipes out your sin when you give your life to him, then why do so many of us walk around like we have a rap sheet in heaven? It's like the Hebrew writer who quotes God in Hebrews 8, verse 12. I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. When uh, we say stuff like this, and, you know, trust me, you don't have to go very far to find a guilty person. And, and, and even people in Christ who are still haunted by guilt constantly. You know, and people say things like, well, okay, I understand God forgives me in Jesus, but I just can't forgive myself. And what you're saying is, the blood of Jesus is good enough for God, but it's not good enough for you 
Stop it. Stop it. Grow up. And rejoice over the triumph of the cross. We need to stop constantly beating ourselves up with memories that heaven has no record of. Because we're covered by the blood of Christ. And when the enemy reminds you of your failures, you remind him of the triumph of our Lord Jesus. So be warned. We are the body of Christ. We can't afford to ever become disconnected from the head, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But we need to remember the huge, unbelievable gift of God dying on a cross for you and me. And it's, grace is not about, well, you know, Jesus gave a lot and we make up the difference. It's about understanding that Jesus gave it all. Uh, I, I find it interesting that there are two great marks of uh, the church that belongs to Christ. Uh, there are two important things that come up over and over again, and that is the Lord's Supper and baptism. And both of those take us back to the cross. And often I have uh, told you that when a person gives their life to Christ in the biblical way, uh, the Bible says that God wants us to be baptized into Christ. And people will say, well, you know, that's just a human work. Aren't we contributing to our salvation? No, it's not a human work. It's the work of God. You take some uh, gurgling water back here. There's nothing magic about it. I guarantee you there's uh, nothing all that amazing about Dalton Gardens water. The amazing part is that we can acknowledge our need, that we are spiritually dead, and so we're going to be buried with Christ, and then I've said on a number of times, and the very power of God will bring us up and make a new creation from us. And I've had people ask me, where'd you get that? I got it from Colossians 2. Look at uh, verse 12. It, it says, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. The very same power that brought Christ out of the tomb is the power that we tap into when God raises us up out of the water. Do you have faith in that? Or do you not? And so, we need to be rooted in the triumph of Jesus and grow in him. And no matter how young or how old we are, if we know the difference between right and wrong, we don't need to be fixed up. We need to be buried. so that we might know God's transformational power in our lives.